So this chapter deals with refrigeration and heat pump systems. Today we'll review the Carnot refrigeration system as well as cover vapor compression refrigeration. So what are the components of a Carnot refrigeration system? Well, typically we put an evaporator here, put a compressor here, put a condenser here, and for a Carnot, we don't put an expansion valve, we put a turbine here. And the refrigerant flows from the evaporator to the compressor, from the compressor to the condenser, from the condenser to the turbine, from the turbine to the evaporator in a loop. And often we put this is state one as the outlet of the evaporator inlet to the compressor. This is state two. This would be state three. And this is state four. Now the compressor and the turbine have pressure changes across them. There's a pressure gain across the compressor, pressure loss or drop across the turbine. What about the condenser? Are, is there a pressure difference from two to three in the condenser? No, it's a heat exchanger. Likewise, the evaporator is a heat exchanger. We neglect the pressure difference. I know that any time there's fluid flow through a tube or path, a, a piping system, there is going to be some pressure drop, but we neglect it. What we can do is we can sketch out a property diagram, a temperature enthalpy diagram, as well as a pressure enthalpy diagram, but let's leave the pressure enthalpy diagram for later. Let's just go back to the temperature entropy diagram. The temperature entropy diagram, TS diagram. For the Carnot refrigeration system, we want all of the heat that is rejected in the condenser, Q condenser, which is the rate of heat transfer divided by the rate at which mass is flowing through the condenser. We want all of that heat transfer to be at one temperature to reject it at the high temperature, TH. Likewise, in the evaporator, Q in the evaporator, which is the rate of heat transfer into the evaporator divided by M dot, we want all of that to be at TL or TC, depending on your notation, lower temperature or the cold temperature. We want to show a TH right here, a TC right there. The compressor is going to be reversible and adiabatic, hence it's going to be isentropic. Likewise, the turbine will be isentropic. It'll be reversible and adiabatic. Process from 1 to 2 is isentropic, and from 3 to 4 is isentropic. So uh, S4 is equal to S3 and S2 is equal to S1. So what's it look like on a temperature entropy diagram? Well, ought to we peg the state 2 right here as saturated vapor? And when you go all the way to state 3, what are you doing? You're condensing. You're rejecting heat. All at a constant temperature, TH. And then from 3 to 4, it's reversible or isentropic, adiabatic and reversible is isentropic, and then 4 to 1, you have heat gain in the evaporator, and then 1 back up to 2. So there it is. It looks like a box, a rectangle on a temperature entropy diagram. When you solve a problem like this, you probably want to get a sketch of the components, a sketch on a property diagram, set up a table where you have state 1, 2, 3, 4, and properties at each of them, pressure in maybe kilopascal or bar, temperature in degree C, enthalpy, kilojoules per kilogram, entropy, kilojoules per kilogram, Kelvin, and maybe quality. And work through the system, filling up the table. And then you're able to analyze what is the work for each of the components and heat transfers for each of the components. So work in the compressor, when you do a first law analysis around that compressor, it's adiabatic. It's related to H2 minus H1. You've done enough of those, right? First law analysis, open system. And then this uh, heat transfer out of the fluid in the condenser. 
H2 minus H3. We're going to put this work out of the turbine. First law analysis around that turbine, H3 minus H4. And then in the evaporator, H1 minus H4. So you can calculate all of the Ws. There's only two Ws, work of the turbine, work of the uh, compressor, and the two Qs. And then often we have a coefficient of performance for a refrigeration system. It's how well our system's performing. DOP, coefficient of performance, subscript R for refrigeration. And when we talk about heat pumps, COP, subscript HP. A little easier for me to remember. So that's what we desire. We desire a lot of cooling in the evaporator over what it costs to work net, which is to work into the compressor minus some production out of the turbine, which reduces the network that has to be purchased. So there you go. That's the Carnot. Why don't we build Carnot refrigeration systems? Because compressors like to have vapor or superheated vapor. They don't like two-phase. They don't like liquid droplets inside the fluid that's coming into the compressor. Likewise, there isn't a turbine that you feed saturated liquid and expand it. There just isn't any. We like to expand vapors or gases in, in turbines, not liquids. So we modify this system to get what we call a practical vapor compression refrigeration system. So state one moves. So now it's saturated vapor. And when we feed it into our compressor, state two now is superheated vapor, isn't it? State three, we still like to bring out saturated liquid, but we replace the turbine with a simple expansion device known as a expansion valve, a restriction. They're very affordable, very cheap, uh, keeps the cost down and it works well, but it's not reversible. It's highly irreversible. So S4 now is greater than S3. There's entropy generation in the expansion valve. So we don't draw it as a solid line from 3 to 4. We draw it as a dashed line. Why dashed? Irreversibilities. It's irreversible process. And 4 is kicked over. So S4 is greater than S3. And there's now state four. And now you've modified from the Carnot refrigeration to the ideal vapor compression refrigeration system. Uh, if I take a look at the COP of the refrigeration system, let's call it the ideal vapor compression, and I compare it with the coefficient of performance refrigeration system Carnot, which one's greater, or are they equal? Which one has a better coefficient of performance, or are they to have the same? We're going to compare ideal vapor compression refrigeration with the Carnot. Carnot is better. Carnot have a higher COP. Do you get more heat removed from the low temperature for the work supplied? For the Carnot? Yeah, that's right. So this is better. Looking at a temperature entropy diagram, it's not because of a degradation in the compressor. It's because of two things. One is I have heat being rejected at high temperatures. I have to cool the superheated vapor from two down to saturated vapor before it starts to condense in the condenser. And that's heat rejection at a higher temperature. It's, it's harder to pump the heat higher up the temperature hill. Does that make sense? So that's bad for performance. And then also, this is irreversible right in here. And so that degrades the performance of the ideal Ideal vapor compression refrigeration. Maybe I should put an R there. Ideal vapor compression refrigeration.
cycle compared to the Carnot. Uh, one other thing I should have pointed out, as you walk around the cycle, uh, this two, there's only two different pressures. You have the high pressure side and the low pressure side. Low pressure, right? Pressure low. This is a P. Pressure high, pressure low. So pressure two and three are the high pressure. Pressure high, pressure high. Pressure one and four, pressure low, pressure low. Okay. Often state two for the Carnot is saturated vapor. And for three, it's saturated liquid. Right? That's Carnot. When we switch to the ideal vapor compression refrigeration, two isn't saturated vapor. One is saturated vapor. Right? Uh, that's what we switch from, from one being a two phase to being saturated vapor at the inlet to the compressor. So uh, that's what real compressors like. They like vapors. Okay. But state three in both of these cases stays saturated liquid. How does that refrigeration system work? You know, if we go back and we take a look at this expansion valve, the first time you are exposed to this, it's like an impossibility. All right? Think about this. This temperature, the saturated liquid, could be something like 120 degrees F, 130 degrees F. This temperature in here could be something like uh, 35 or 40 degrees F. How do I take fluid? It's a refrigerant, yeah. Flow it through a device that has no work in or heat in, and the temperature comes out 40 degrees F. It comes in 120 and goes out 40. Impossible. Not really. But this is one of those magic things about refrigeration that you, you, it's, you should think about and ponder because when they first came out with this, this was unbelievable. This is not going to work. It's impossible, right? Probably 100 to not even, a little over 100 years ago, if you wanted a cold drink in San Antonio or Houston or New Orleans in the middle of summer, you wanted ice cubes in your drink, how did you get the ice cubes in your drink? You take it for granted. You can go anywhere and get ice cubes now, right? But not that long ago, it was very, very expensive and very costly. Why? Because the ice that was in that drink in New Orleans, let's say in 1850 or something like that, a long time ago, came from water that was frozen in either Minnesota in the middle of winter or somewhere like Massachusetts or you know somewhere along the eastern coast and they put it on they cut it on lakes freshwater lakes chunked the ice took it in wagons loaded it into ships covered it in sawdust shipped it down south chunk took out the chunks of ice and sold it and people would chip off ice that's how you that's how you got your drink right the average person didn't get a drink with ice in it in August so this was a very novel, unbelievable, right, how this works. This is a can of dust away. You can buy it at the local Altex, and you can spray it. And when you spray it, you can clean off the keyboard, or you can clean off the inside of your computer, right? Anybody ever done that? Blow away the dust. What is inside this can? It's refrigerant 134A. I had grabbed this slide a couple semesters ago you can't even get it for nine dollars a can now it's like 12 or more dollars a can but it's still refrigerant 134a pure 134a and they brag about it not leaving any residue when you blow it onto your computer electronics and i'm going to pass this can around and you can feel it if you slosh it there's a sloshing feeling to it Okay, what does that indicate when you have a can and there's a sloshing feeling to it? Kind of, what's that indicate that's inside? Some liquid. 
but also it's sharing space with some vapor. Take a Coke, drink it halfway, put the cap back on and slosh it back and forth, and that's, or a water bottle, and that's what you'll feel, right? The sloshing. So inside this can is refrigerant 134A, pure 134A. And what temperature do you think it's at? Room temperature. So it's 72, 75 degrees F. Two phase. In the presence of gravity, the vapor will go to the top and the liquid will be below. Liquid, and there'll be some vapor like this, right? And when I squeeze the trigger, it lets out some through the nozzle, and what comes out the top? Vapor, the refrigerant 134 a vapor. But as all students, you know, inquisitive minds, you turn this thing upside down, and now the nozzle goes like that. Okay, in the presence of gravity, where's the liquid? And where's the vapor? So when I squeeze the trigger here, what's going to come? What's going to come into the nozzle right here and then come across and come out? Liquid. Now as soon as it exits here, and as soon as it exits here, what is the pressure of the refrigerant 134A? atmospheric pressure before it starts to go into before it starts to go into what is the pressure inside the can what pressure is it I'm going to pause and I want you to tell me the pressure and here's a hint information from this class can you now tell me what the pressure is I know we don't use the English tables very much but we're working in about 70 degree F or 75 degree F. Can you tell me the pressure inside this can right now, pure refrigerant 134A? So we get that the pressure in this can is how many? It says it's about uh, 90, what did I say? 95 PSI? PSI pressure? Notice on the label, I know you can't read it, I'll read it to you. Do not puncture, <laughs> do not incinerate, or do not store above 120 degrees F. All right, so we don't want to do those things. But when I take this and I blow it out, right, I can blow it into a napkin and I can feel the temperature of that that comes out. It's about 75 degrees F. But if I turn it upside down and I blow it, what's now going to start into the restriction liquid? And what's going to come out, it's still the same pressure down here, but I need a napkin. Do not blow it onto your skin. You will get what they call a burn, a freeze burn. And you want to blow it into a napkin or something, just a little bit, and then you can feel it. Is it cold? It's cold. All right. I'm going to pass it around. You can feel the sloshing in the can, and you can feel the coldness. Now, if you're good, I trust you to turn it upside down, but don't play. Don't spray your friend in the face or anything like that. Because I think we can analyze the vapor compression refrigeration system and run some numbers, but we use this in home air conditioning systems. So here's the image of a home, and it has on the outside of the home, sitting in the backyard or on the side yard, what they call a, a condensing unit. Have anybody seen these around? You know what I'm talking about? That's the noisy part when it kicks on. So there's two major components in the condensing unit. The coil, the condensing coil, as well as the <coughs> compressor. The compressor. Now, there's refrigerant lines. One flows the refrigerant into the house. One flows the refrigerant from the house back to the condensing unit. Okay? So there's two lines. And they connect up to something either in the attic, as shown in this illustration, or in a closet. Here it's horizontally oriented in the attic. And what happens is, is the evaporator coil is up here in this quote-unquote furnace. Why do they call it the furnace? Because in the winter, you don't run refrigerant up into the evaporator coil 
but often you'll have electric resistive heating going on up there, or you'll be burning natural gas to provide heating to the house in the winter. So they call it the furnace. Or the indoor unit, if you want to be more generic. Often there's a little grill. Maybe it's in the ceiling of your house. Like over here, you'll see some return air coming out. That's supply air in this room here. And you could take that grill away, and right away there'd be an air filter. Maybe you have to get up on a ladder and change that air filter. Or maybe they put it in a wall, and then the wall is ducted up and goes into the furnace. So it's either on the ceiling or on the wall. And right away it goes through a, the grill and then the filter. Then the air blows across this evaporator coil in the middle of August. Is the air that goes across the evaporator coil going to get hot or going to get cold? Everybody, you need to work with me on all of these, right? Because I know some of you got this down pat. But I want 100% to really dominate air conditioning systems. You're going to end up graduating. You're going to pass this class. You're going to go home. Somebody's going to say, oh, what would you study? Oh, I studied uh, thermodynamics. Wow, that's a long word. What would you learn in that class? <laughs> oh, we learned all about engines. Then they want to pop their hood and start asking you questions. Or they want to talk about aircraft engines. Every time I fly, I look out the wing. I get scared. And then, or they want to talk about air conditioning. You know, oh, I studied refrigeration and air conditioning. I've got 1,001 questions for you. Right? So this is helping you for those 1,001 questions. So the air becomes cold as it flows across the evaporator. Maybe it came in at 75 degrees F, or maybe you like it really chilly in your house, and it came into the, into the furnace at 70 degrees F. It's the indoor air temperature that's drawn in to the duct, put across the filter, then across the evaporator coil. When it comes across the evaporator coil, it may be down in the 40 degree F, 45 degree F, depending on what you're running, could be a little hotter than that too, 50, 55 degree F. But then you're going to dump it into different rooms. There'll be a, 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 a ductwork routing it through the attic. Make sense? So that's how it works. So when you uh, are sitting there, you're feeling maybe 50, 55 degree F air coming down, sinking into the room and cooling you. Maybe you're laying on your bed trying to sleep and you feel it when the air conditioning system's working. What I would like to do is I'd like to continue to encourage you to ask questions. In a residential air conditioning system, just like the one we sketched, without shouting it out, could you write down the answer to, where would I find the compressor? Where would I find the compressor? I know I just said it, but that was a few minutes ago, right? And then, look, at no matter what I say, a couple semesters later, that information's gone. And then, where is the evaporator? And then, where is the condenser? And where is some expansion valve? Those were the four major components we studied. In your mind, where are those at, right? Should I give you a minute to write down where they're at? And I'll come around and take a look at some of your answers. So the compressor and the condenser are, this is the noisy one, right? It's noisy, and uh, you want that away from your inside of the house. P compressors are outside. Plus, they pump a lot of energy, heat, into the system, and right away, right after the compressor, you got to condense the refrigerant. And so keep them close together, reject the heat to the outside, condense it outside. So the condensing unit has the compressor and the condenser. The condenser is nothing but a condensing coil. It's heat exchanger. The evaporator is another coil, heat exchanger. That's where the refrigerant gets cold. That's where you blow warm air over it and make it really cold. Right? The air goes from 75 down to 55 or 50, or even lower, depending on your application. Could be more of a walk-in. I've been in some of your houses. That's not a house. It's a walk-in refrigerator. Yeah, you guys so cold? 
It's like, I didn't even know you could set it to 60 like that. <laughs> so anyway, the expansion valve is right where it's the inlet to the evaporator coil. So these go together, and they're cold. The evaporator and expansion valve are real close together because as soon as you pass over the expansion valve, it's now cold. As soon as it came out of that can we're passing around, it's cold. It's ready to absorb heat and cool off air. So this is the condensing unit. Notice it's made up primarily of a wraparound coil, great big heat exchanger. Different manufacturers have different designs. Train has like a tube with little fins sticking off. Most of them have tubes that run inside of uh, fins that run up and down, okay? And uh, the air is drawn into, and then a fan rotating on the top blows out, and so the outdoor air gets hotter. You're heating the outdoor air when you run your air conditioning system. That's where you have to reject the heat to. So the fan right here is drawing it up, the air over the coil. So let me ask you this. On a hot day, let's say it's the hottest day in San Antonio, 110 degrees F. Have you ever been there? I have. Guess what? You have this air conditioner on the west side of your house. It's beating down sun on top of it. You could fry an egg on it, even without it running, right? So the air around there is around 120 degrees F. Do you want your air conditioner system to stop working because it's too hot? on the day that it's finally 100 and 110. And you have a bunch of guests over to your house. You're entertaining them. Do you want, you're like, oh, the outdoor temperature's too high. The air conditioning system took a break and we're now all gonna sweat. No, 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 no. Engineer will get called and called and called again. You know, you got a problem here, you gotta fix it. Actually, the design engineers have figured this out a long time ago. But the, the service guy that installed it will get called that day. Believe me, if it's not satisfactory to the customer. So uh, this needs to reject heat on the hottest of the hot days. And so the refrigerant inside probably is about 15 to 20 degrees higher than that. Maybe it's uh, 135 degrees F. Gives you a 15 degree, 20 degree delta T to reject the heat. All right. The compressor, as soon as it comes out of the compressor, it's piped over and goes through the condenser and then collects up and then goes back into the house. And so what comes out of the compressor? What is the state of the refrigerant coming out of the compressor going into the coil? Superheated. It could come out another 30, 40, I don't know how many more degrees above that. And then it condenses once it gets to 135 or so. All right. And then after the condenser, it's ready to return. Uh, there's two lines connecting it to the house. What goes to the house? Does liquid go to the house or does vapor go to the house? Okay, that's a tough question. I knew it would be. And then if, let's say, liquid goes to the house, vapor must return from the house, right? Or if vapor goes to the house, liquid must return from the house. True? Right? So let's pause. I want you to tell me what is supplied to the house, the liquid or the vapor? All right, so the consensus is, is that liquid's going to the house. True? All right, now the next question is, is you look at those lines. One is big, large diameter. One small diameter. Hmm, which line do I need, the large diameter or the small diameter line for the liquid to go in? I'm going to let you think about that. Yep, I know it. Let me ask you this. The mass flow rate that is the liquid going to the house compared to the mass flow rate of the vapor coming from the house, which one's greater or are they equal? The mass flow rate of the liquid going to the house, is it greater than the mass flow rate of the vapor coming from the house, or less, or equal? 
you're so gun shy now that I, you know, ask a question or two. I'm going to return to that question, okay? Because I really think everybody should struggle. But I'm going to move on a little bit. Notice over the years that these boxes sitting outside in the back have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. It's proof that there is a rampant uh, uh, misuse of steroids in the air conditioning industry. <laughs> no, it's basically, you can kind of see by the numbering system that they're starting to get higher and higher SEER numbers. SEER, Seasonal Energy Efficiency Ratio, okay? And to do that, you need to fine tune as an engineer the system to optimize its performance. From an entropy point of view, where do you have degradation of performance in this refrigeration system? In the coils. Anytime you have a heat transfer through a finite temperature difference. So what you try to do is you try to shave down the delta T between the hot outdoor air and the temperature of the refrigerant in the condensing coil. Because if you can get the temperature uh, lower in the condensing coil, so to speak, then you don't need such a high pressure boost of the compressor. So the compressor doesn't have to work as hard. Save energy, be more efficient. So they make the heat exchanger coils larger, 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 and larger. So the delta T, the temperature difference between the refrigerant in the coil and the outdoor air is smaller and smaller and smaller. So just as a review, what is on the outside of the house? What do they call that box? Condensing unit. Why don't they just call it the condensing coil? Because the compressor stuck in there too. It's usually stuck right in the middle of it. All right. And what do they call this? Indoor unit, furnace, something. Okay. All right. So what is now, we have a better idea of what's in this condensing unit. It's the condensing coil and the compressor. Then there's a set of lines, the line set they call it. One supply, one return. Goes up to, here I've shown a, a, a vertical furnace, meaning this may be in the closet of your house. How many people know if their furnace is in the attic or if it's in the closet? Yours is in the closet? Closet. Mine was in the closet, okay? So I opened the door and there it was. Now notice right below, it usually was a half door. Right below it was a little grill to let air in in the hallway or somewhere. And there, the air would come in and it would be a return air plenum. There may be multiple paths to get air underneath that furnace. In my house, it was a couple different ways it went there, okay? But then, once it was there, it went across an air filter, and then every now and then I'd have to open the closet door, pull out that air filter, and change it. Do you know if your, your, yours maybe is one of the improved ones, doesn't have an air filter? There isn't any one that doesn't have an air filter. If you don't know where your air filter is, somebody else in your house has been doing the maintenance on it. Or you need to start saving a lot of money because the bill is coming due. These systems will really ultimately fail if you don't have and maintain a good air filter on it. And if you have a pet or two that has hair that then falls off and gets sucked around and, and it clogs it up, okay? So it, the filters are extremely important and they're extremely cheap in the grand scheme of things. Now, the blower blows the air across the heat exchanger. In the winter, there's a gas furnace burning, and it's a, there's a metal that separates it so you don't get any carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide or anything like that, and it's flued out. But otherwise, in the winter, you're using it, but in the summer, the air just passes over that surface and nothing happens to it. All right. Then it comes up, and it goes where you have a coil and a coil, and it passes over the coils like this. And it collects, and then it goes out a duct system. This is the cooling. That's the evaporator coil. Okay. Why is it shaped like this? Well, we'll talk about that. What letter of the alphabet does that look like? 
Guess what the engineers and the technicians call that coil? The A coil. The A coil, right? So why, why do they have it like this? Well, when you have air San Antonio, hot air, or Houston hot air, and you cool it, it will sometimes condense and give off some of the vapor as liquid. And that condensate collects. So they put it like this so that the, it'll drip down the edges. It'll collect in a little pan. It'll go around to a corner, and then the corner will bring it out and drip it out a pipe on the outside. And the first time, maybe you remember this. I remember this. I was young. Hey, Mom. Hey, Dad. We have a problem. There's a pipe outside. It's leaking. We got a faucet leaking. I don't know. Come look. It's gushing out. Wasn't doing this in the middle of winter. Didn't you do that? I remember that. And so, okay, so you go out there and that's that condensate dripping, dripping, dripping. And that's a big problem and a practical issue because if this line gets clogged up, guess where the condensate goes? Into the house somewhere and makes a puddle in the ceiling. Ah, oh, it's nasty stuff. Yeah, terrible. So anyway, the condensate is a practical concern. This is what the A coil looks like. You know, they have it sealed here to prevent the air. They want the air, this is all sealed here too. And it, the air is going to come up and then flow across and then collect up in the ducts. And so this sits tightly in the duct system right here, this edge and the back edge, this edge and the back edge. Seals tightly. They, they have actually two drain lines for the water condensate. And they typically have an alarm system. Engineers were smart. Enough times it's like, hold it, we want a bet, better, we want redundancy. So if the first drain line clogs or something, the water level goes a little higher, it'll trip the alarm, but before the technician gets there to fix it, we have a second drain line will still work and get the water out. Otherwise, you could get thousands of dollars of damage, right? So now let's take a look here at the passageway. I have a small diameter line coming and a large diameter line. The large diameter line is connected to four. This is a manifold with four tubes going up into the coil. The small one comes over here, and then there's four little tubes that come out right here, and they go two over here and two over there. All right. Does refrigerant come in the small, or does it go in the large diameter? In the small one. Then guess where the expansion valve is? Right there. That's the pressure drop. Right after it, it manifold goes to four lines to spread it quickly to get it to the evaporator coil. Then it starts to flow back and forth in a pattern like this until when it comes out the top, guess what it is? It's all vapor. It's all vapor. Now you have four paths going through your, your coil. Then it's collected up in this manifold and then out. What's going to come out this larger diameter? Vapor, vapor, vapor. Where's it got to go? Back down to the con uh, compressor and the condensing unit. Well, here's another one. They only get more complex. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Uh, this, this is the, the liquid line coming in. Then you go through. This is a, like a TXV um, that ex uh, controls the flow. It splits off. It looks like there's one, two, one, two, three, I think there's six and six. There's probably another one in here. But they can get more complex. But it's the A-coil. It's sealed at the top. You have a catch and a little water drain down here. I'm out of time. We'll continue this next time.